What's up everyone? My name's Michaela and we're here celebrating Women's History Month with Brigadier General Colley von Hoffman. I just want to say Hi Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I just want to say that I am so excited that I get to interview you and I'm really excited to learn more about you. Me too. As the commander of the Ogden Air Logistics Complex, you lead a team of over 9,000 personnel that perform depot maintenance, repair, overhaul, and modification of the A-10 Thunderbolt, the C-130 Hercules, the T-38 Talon, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, the F-22 Raptor, F-35 Lightning II, yep. and the um, Minuteman Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System. Yep. It must have taken a lot of drive to get to where you are in your career, and you've probably had to make a lot of really difficult decisions. Has there ever been a time that you wanted to throw in the towel? And if so, how did you work through that? I think you, you wouldn't be human if there weren't days or particularly mornings where you go, I just, I don't know how I, how I continue to do this. But um, never a long period of time, always something really brief because I truly have enjoyed all the things that I've gotten to do in uniform and in, most importantly, all the airmen that I've gotten to serve with. So, um, so it's been, you know, there are days that are tougher than others, but I've enjoyed, uh, overall enjoyed all of it. In the spirit of Women's History Month, one of the most important movements for women is, of course, Rosie the Riveter. As you know, the Rosie the Riveter movement changed the course of history and paved the way for women who wanted to work in um, particularly male-dominated careers. Do you relate in any way to the achievements of this movement and how it removed barriers for women? Um, I do. I love, you know, I love when you really look at, it's a Norman Rockwell um, painting, Rosie the Riveter, and when you really look at her, it, to me, it embodies all the great things about being female and then the military, although so she was a civilian worker, but it's, it's kind of the same. It shows that you're still a woman, but that she's you know she's flexing her muscles so she's really strong and so it's not a choice between one or the other it shows kind of everything and so I really love that part of the particular painting but um, but identifying in what that meant and in you said it women moving into tr traditionally male roles and particularly in the Department of Defense which is where that you know where that comes from um, is it, it means a lot to me um, I there women are um, positions are open more and more every year that people get into the positions that become open, but more and more people move into them than, um, than before. But we still have a, lot of, a long ways to go before we see a lot more women. We have them in a lot of different roles. Still have the same number of women in the Air Force anyway that, that we did 10 years ago, and I'd like to see that be more. In the course of your career, have you seen or experienced a change in Air Force culture that enabled or improved inclusiveness of women? Uh, so, Michaela, that's a great, great one because I've been in the Air Force a long time, so I should have seen <laughs> something. <laughs> so it's um, 31 years uh, this May that I'll have been in the Air Force. And when I came in the Air Force, um, I, there's, you know, one of the biggest examples, women couldn't fly fighters um, when I came in. And you didn't see a lot of women on the flight line. Um, either uh, as maintainers. And s since that point, there, there have been many um, positions open up to women and many people see, many women seeking other, you know, non-traditional roles. And the Air Force has responded well to that. Um, I, I think every year it, it, it gets better. I remember um, being a lieutenant and um, a, a more senior officer said to me, you're the best female officer I've ever worked with. And he meant that well. That was not an insult. And I remember thinking, yeah, I kind of like to be the best officer you'd ever worked with, or some something to that effect. You certainly don't hear those things anymore. And um, and so just um, an awareness of of both genders being in the workplace is just it's different. Instead of there being an exception to having women in the workplace now, it's certainly um, just matter of course. And um, so there's definitely um, been a change and I think the Air Force has done a really good job of, of encouraging more women to come into the Air Force and see themselves as somebody that can succeed in the Air Force. What advice would you give to a young woman who is looking to start a career with the Air Force, whether it be enlisted, commissioned, or serving as a civilian airman? Oh boy, I would, 
I would be super excited to meet somebody that was considering coming into the Air Force in any of those uh, ways. And I think the advice I would give them is to say, believe in yourself first. You may come in and you may come in and work in a shop that still doesn't have a lot of women in them, um, if any, but that's okay. That makes it fun. You're going to bring in your unique talents and your unique perspective. And that diversity is what makes the Air Force so strong. So I would advise them to be excited about that and not worried about that. And then as they come in, just continue to really um, look at the things, how well they can do things and how well they can adopt their position, but then also how they can um, help it, help make us better. Because that's, that's really important. We, we rely on everybody's different way of looking at things and, and, and their innovative ways of um, bringing their talents to us. And so that's what I would advise them to come in first. We want you and, um, and be ready to, to, to work and share your talents. What advice would you give women who aspire to take leadership roles? Um, so I would say go get it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, giddy up. I, I um, hope that all women, whether they're in the military or otherwise, see themselves in leadership roles. And it is always um, whatever that one little extra thing that you're doing in your current assignment or your current job is. To, to be looking for that, what sets you apart from somebody else and really go after that. And so I don't, I don't necessarily think that that's any different for a woman or a man um, looking for leadership roles. It's, you know, do the very best job, very best that you can in the job that you're in today, but always look for that one little thing extra that sets you apart um, from your peers because as the senior leaders are looking at who's going to come up behind them, that's what we're looking for, those people that are looking to, to, to have a broader sense of their role in the, in the Air Force. And so that's what I would advise somebody. Are there any mentors who have made a really big difference in your life? And if so, would you mind telling us about them? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I have a few that, that pop up to mind first. I think everybody starts with this one, but my mother is an incredibly strong personality. She's full of life and she enjoys everything that she's doing all the time. She also has an incredible work ethic. And so um, she passed that along to me. And so she's definitely has, has been a mentor and a parent and uh, I wouldn't be with where I am without her. And um, she got that from my great aunt and a namesake um, of mine who was born in the 20s and had a private pilot's license when she was 23 years old in the 40s, which was very unusual. And she sailed off to New Orleans by herself when she was 25 to become a journalist, which was also a male-dominated profession back then. And so she was always that somebody in our family that was kind of breaking those barriers. And she passed that along to my mother, at, who passed that along um, to me. And then in, in my career, um, I've had two women who have, have been super mentors to me. And one, when I was a um, junior major, and her name was Colonel Maggie Timmons, retired. And in the late 70s, she became the first female transportation officer. Also, um, not a pilot, but also a career field in the Air Force that had very few women, definitely, in the 70s. And she made it all the way to Colonel, um, to full Colonel, as as a transportation officer. And she was a great mentor to me, and part of her advice was to me is, be the officer that you're gonna be. Don't any, make any ex excuses for gender or anything else. And the other thing that she said was that all, to always keep the balance of family and work. Because at that time, um, I was trying to do both 100% and had young kids and all of that. And she would kind of keep me on the level thing and just say, the kind of good good advice that you would want from a from a mentor, and then um, and then later in my career it was uh, Major General retired K J Johnson. Um, she's uh, uh, fantastic, been a maintainer um, and a super smart lady that broke a lot of barriers in the maintenance career field, and um, and also managed to to raise an incredible family at the same time and and have a dual military career uh, uh, dual military careers which is pretty hard to do. And, um, and the Air Force has, has put many more things in place now to make it easier for families to do that. But she came up 
before we, um, a lot of those things were in place and managed to, to have a career both for her husband and herself. And so she's been a great mentor to me. So you're talking about breaking barriers. You're the first reservist commander in a depot. How did that come to be? Well, it's really exciting. So I, in the um, period of my career, I, like many reservists, have um, been what we call like an operationally ready reserve. We started deploying in the early 2000s after 9-11 along our active duty counterparts, and we have really stayed in that battle rhythm since then. So that blur between what's the reserve component and what's the active duty component has kind of, particularly when you talk about units and individuals, we've all rotated uh, in and out of AORs about the same. Now we've all had some of the t same assignments, the same experiences as active duty. So that kind of Cold War mentality is you, you only go to the reserve when you absolutely need to do it and, and all hell's breaking loose. It, that's gone. Uh, since, like I said, since 9-11, the reserve and active duty have, have really um, worked side by side. And so by the time you, you've done that for now 20 years, um, the, act, the, the Air Force senior leaders can go in and say, who's the right person for this position? And it's, it's less about the status of the person and what experience they've had leading up to, to what they need to fill that particular position. So that's kind of that's kind of how it is, and and I'm not the only one. There's um, different uh, Air National Guardsmen and different reservists filling active duty roles in their active duty um, airmen in traditionally reserve positions as well. So it's kind of neat how it's come about. Awesome. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about all the women who are a part of the Ogden Air Logistics Complex? Oh yes, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, you know, we have uh, PhD chemists in the um, complex that, that work, and we have 24-year-old uh, women winding generators. We have 50-year-old women working on the F-16 uh, depo maintenance line, the pr our production line. We have women going down in the silos in our northern tier bases doing um, work on corrosion in, in those particular silos. So we have, we have a wide range, young and old, in all level, levels of experience, and it's really exciting. It's a great place to, to come to work. For anybody, love to see more women coming through the door here. <laughs>